Hello, universe! Toward to the max extreme here. Dinosaur Neil! And Ghost Hunter Dave. Together, we form a sigil as Imperious Rex. Oh, man. I don't know if you form a sigil. We've got a lot to learn. <laughs> <laughs> we may have fucked this up already. <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure. We don't know a whole lot about magic, but mm -hmm. we're here to learn. Mm -hmm. And right. if you're watching this, maybe you are too. Mm -hmm. Also, maybe you're much more knowledgeable than us on this subject, so go easy. <laughs> <laughs> And so we return and begin again The world turns our key It's the start, it's the end Our heads are all the same Large enough to contain The God and the devil, a palace, a rebel Our sentence is up It's time to go and let yourself become invisible Create your heaven here on earth Think if the, the unthinkable Find your truth within the light Jump off the edge and start to fly Time to wake up, time to wake up and say goodbye. from Lisa Crowley, a uh, LA-based musician. You can check out her her other work from our description below, mm -hmm. but uh, she collaborated with us on this, and this is an original OG yeah. piece. Yeah. yeah. Is this good? I hope you like it, because I'm going to start every fucking episode with this. <laughs> we are in our first stop in the Invisible College. That's right. Yeah. Uh, first day of class. Class in session. Hopefully you've seen the syllabus. Because mm -hmm. I I don't remember it, <laughs> but I did read the Invisibles. All right, which is yeah. a plus. Yeah. Uh, just moments ago, right? I finished <laughs> Down to the Wire. No. Why would you Classic. expect any less? But it's... Neil, you went kind of above and beyond, right? You did a little extracurricular reading. I did. Yeah. Well, yeah. I reviewing. I, you watched I, the yep, movie. Exactly. You, you I watched the movie adaptation. I watched uh, our good professor friend Cody Walker's introduction video just to kind of get a, a nice little head start. And I also watched that Grant Morrison documentary that you can find on YouTube. That's right. Talking with Gods. Yes. Uh, directed by Patrick Meany. Yep. Who also wrote this companion book that we will reference uh, throughout this entire book club series because <laughs> he makes this a lot more clear than... I could have done without this help. <laughs> this is something that I've been itching to do for quite a while. Yeah. But I've been a little, little scared because this is a grand undertaking and I didn't want to do it an injustice. Mm -hmm. we, we did try it. We did. Yeah. <laughs> a little well, bit. Yeah. You tried it. Yep. And I sat there and took it. Yeah. <laughs> you took it like a champ, though. Yeah. But we thought it was time to return to this series. Um, we've been doing these monthly book clubs for quite some time. We just finished Sandman. Mm -hmm. We did Morrison's uh, Doom Patrol, mm -hmm. Swamp Thing. And it just seemed like the universe was in alignment to tackle the Invisibles. Hmm. And we are uh, premiering this episode, first day class, on the Vernal Equinox, which is a moment of light, expanding, creativity, flourishing. It just seems like the perfect way to kick this off. Hmm. Could have kicked it off with a sigil, but we're just getting started. Yeah, we're no, just no. forming one right now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think any of us know exactly what a sigil is yet. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. So the Invisibles, gentlemen, we're finally there. Mm -hmm. Where do you even start? 
with an undertaking <gasps> like this. Issue one. <laughs> God damn. You got it. You. It's your first Magic. One. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be my third time through the series. Correct me if I'm wrong. First. This is both your first. First. Mm -hmm. All right. Did you have any preconceived notions or expectations before you dove in? I mean, I was talked at for about an hour, so uh -huh. I do know... Uh, Everything about it and how it ends. <laughs> Surprisingly, no. <laughs> you wasn't listening that whole time. I did a lot of this. <laughs> All the fun little black and white cartoon hoot nanny. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, I have the gist of mm -hmm. what it was about, and I also have the benefit of knowing... A decent amount of Grant Morrison's history before getting into this. Yeah. I would say that's almost paramount in enjoying Boy, it and it? understanding this <laughs> yeah. work. Because not only is it just a trippy sci-fi action thriller, it is essentially an autobiography of Grant's life before and during the writing of this. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what they were into, what they were researching, where they went, what they did... It's almost like a journal, like a fictional journal mm -hmm. of their experiences, some a bit more life-changing than others, as we'll get into, but just kind of a cool, like, recount of their life at this stage. Yeah. Which is, like, really appealing to me. Like, what a cool way to kind of look back at your life, but in this fun, crazy, like, super spy adventure. So does the book start off as, like an autobiography type deal or does it eventually merge into it I it feels like it starts off that way <clears throat> i know it has a lot of um traits of their personality mm -hmm. starting in this but i didn't know if he had like a, a bit of an idea of what he wanted to do for a story and then he has a whole cat man do experience and then maybe it goes on from that like i know i know yeah. a little bit about yeah. it I think Grant went in with a pitch and an idea, and then as it went on, I feel like it probably kind of took on a life of its own and was a bit more free-flowing. Mm -hmm. And we should also say, right up top, this work is very open to interpretation. A lot of what you get out of this is going to result in how much you put into it. Mm -hmm. You can just like read this as like a sci-fi book and maybe enjoy it if you squint, <laughs> but if you do want to like think on a, I don't want to sound like too studious, but like kind of start thinking about like some higher level concepts, I think you're going to get a lot more out of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Looking at you, Troy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is 59 issues. It was published by Vertigo Comics between 1994 and 2000. Morrison mm -hmm. penned every issue along with a variety of artists. We're going to be looking at the first eight issues, which was collected in the very first volume, Volume 1, Say You Want a Revolution. Mm -hmm. And the artists contributing to this is Steve Yowell and Jill Thompson. And I would say they both offer a very kind of grounded, I would say almost, not in a bad way, but like almost a very pedestrian artistic it, style. It actually Not a lot of flash. It actually reminded me of like the more common issues of, like, Sandman. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it was kind of like maybe a Vertigo house style at that time. Yeah, yeah, maybe. What's... Okay, I just want to talk about how this collected at first. Because, mm -hmm. like, I brought... I bought digital editions of this. Mm -hmm. And the first eight issues are in it, but then it also has, like, five more issues in the first collection of it. Yeah. And I'm like... How is this broken up? And did I read the right amount? Because <laughs> I this got has here. happened before. Because <laughs> I got here and I'm like, I read it all, and then I was thinking like, oh shit, maybe because you said did one I thing. read it all? <laughs> <laughs> you said one thing before we started recording, and I'm like, oh shit, I don't, I don't quite remember that as well. And then you said something I did remember, so I'm like, okay, back on track. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I read the first eight issues, so I'm like, okay, I'm in the clear. It's a roller coaster, let me tell you. Boy, is it. This book has been collected in a couple different ways. So we're going with the way it was collected in trade paperbacks, which is seven volumes. It was also collected in four hardcovers. So mm -hmm. that's just kind of... That's what I got. Yeah. 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 And that's how I'm reading it digitally too, but I'm just stopping at eight. Everyone stop at eight here. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then there's also this giant omnibus, which impossible is impossible to read. To read. <laughs> actually, a safety hazard if you read it on your back. <laughs> Watch out, Neil. That shelf might not oh, oh, God. oh, God. It's full of omnibus. <laughs> if you see me glancing down, I have a shit ton of notes here. But it's going to make for a better experience for you at home. Um, I just wanted to set some context mm. on what the comic landscape, the cultural comic landscape, was when this came out. So Sandman was just wrapping its run with the Kindly Ones, the second to last trade of that. The Vertigo imprint actually became Vertigo just a year prior before it was just DC. Mm. So like Doom Patrol, all those were just DC. Mm. It wasn't Vertigo yet. Sweet. I guess. <laughs> DC was reeling from the death of Superman, and Marvel was balancing Maximum Carnage, The Clone Saga, and Age of Apocalypse all God. at this time. You so they had time to be Marvel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there was certainly like a, uh, I would say, a, a market for something different. <laughs> and that is exactly oh, yeah. what this is. Yeah. How different? Very different, yeah. as it would turn out. So different that, like, it almost bombed after the first volume. Because it was just, like, maybe a little too high concept right off the bat. Like, people had no idea what to make of this. Yeah. That was actually... I kind of wanted to touch on that point briefly, now that you've brought it up. Because I was wondering the same thing. Yeah, like, how this was, like, received in, what, 94? Or whenever the, the, it came out. Because, mm -hmm. like, it's it's... It's... It's a tough sell. This was Marvel. also a period of time, too, where, like, indie comics were, like, very large and doing their own thing. Yeah. And, like, getting... I mean, they weren't doing huge numbers, but they were doing... It was a very good market for indie comics, which could be weird and their own thing. And this was one that was doing its own thing, and it was at DC. Mm. Yeah. And, it, I mean, this was part of what they called, like, the British invasion of, like, Morrison... Peter Milligan, Alan Moore, Neil Gaiman, all coming over and yeah. writing these very, like, adult comics. Yeah. And Morrison was already, uh, I mean, they had made bank from Batman Arkham Asylum prior yeah. to this. So they yeah. were an established name, and I think that gave Grant just basically a blank Carte check launch. to do whatever <laughs> you wanted, and this is what they wanted to do. So I think at that time, like, the comic landscape was ready for whatever Grant Morrison was going to put down. And, but I don't know how well it was received right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And I guess maybe I'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> In a nutshell, The Invisibles is about a group of counterculture revolutionaries known as the Invisible College, who are at constant war with an oppressive authoritarian regime known as the Outer Church. That is the elevator pitch. We are introduced to the players through the eyes of a young punk asshole named Dane McGowan <laughs> as he is rescued and recruited. Arsehole. Arsehole. Yeah. Get the fuck! <laughs> uh, Dane is rescued and recruited into the Invisible Cell, uh, composed of King Mob, Lord Fanny, Ragged Robin, and Boy. That is essentially the easiest way to describe the story of this. Mm -hmm. However, The Invisibles is way more than a story. I would say it's more of just like a bunch of really, really high concept ideas that Morrison, I think, is more interested in exploring those and kind of like reading between the lines of those than they are of like actually telling like a three-act story. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I th yeah, you can... You yes. Can, yeah, <laughs> this is true. You can tell that just by the, kind of the introduction to, to Dane McGowan. Like, that was like, that's the most grounded that I, this is, I'm assuming ever going to get. Absolutely. So, like... <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, yeah. So, th those first, it, it's like the, um, I don't know, it's like the first issue that's pretty much just related to him being an asshole, you know, he's a smart kid, mm -hmm. like, just getting into trouble, like, all of his teachers know, he's like that, he's, he's we've seen he's it before. He's the kid that everyone went to school with, that yeah. could really make something of himself if he just fucking buckled down yeah. and quit being, like, such a punk. Yeah. But know? he'll also throw a Molotov cocktail in a car, so, I mean. In a school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and a car. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One, he does that, he, he, Molotov's a lot of cars, he's, actually. He's pretty big into these Molotov <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
you're really on board because it's like selling you the idea of of Dane, and then like the shit hits the fan like immediately after that. But when he like the invisible college stuff starts rolling through. Yeah, we should mention if anyone doesn't know this, this came out quite a few years before the Matrix. Mm. As you'll read this, you'll find many similarities to the Matrix, mm -hmm. including just kind of like the grounded way that Neo perceives the world before. He is, like, ushered into the Matrix, and his eyes are open to the reality behind the scenes. Yeah. And that is what the Invisibles is. Yeah, yeah. Down to, like, the weird leather fetish wear, <laughs> and, like, the kind mirrors. of... Mirrors. Mi magic mirrors. Yeah. The goon henchmen agents. All of that is 100% uh, inspired by the Invisibles. <laughs> so with that all out of the way, what did you guys think of these first eight issues? I would Drunk. say it was a bit of a roller coaster for me. I thought it started not great. Like the first initial issue, I, I wasn't so much into. But like when Jack, well, I'm sorry, Dane. <laughs> yeah, J Dane goes by the code name Jack Frost later um, on, so they're kind of interchangeable. Um, when he starts his like initiation into the Invisibles, I really like actually like that. It's pretty much like the he's. Being shown the Matrix. If we say, uh, we might, we could actually just cut this in half by just saying like, it's like the Matrix. <laughs> it's like the Matrix. I actually quite enjoyed that little span of issues and that was like two and a half issues or so. Mm -hmm. His whole like getting into it and like over the hump of like trying to understand it and King Mob telling him kind of like, and not even King Mob, it was, um. Tom O'Bedlam. Yeah. Old Tom. Him yeah. giving, him giving him a lesson. Yeah, and yeah. just like a, trying to kill him, him a hell of a, yeah, yeah. Gives him a couple lessons. <laughs> I I quite like that little adventure because the first issue I couldn't tell you heads or tails what the fuck it was about. I have no idea. It was going all over the place. It was showing all these other people like the poets. Was that the poets were in that one? No, that's five, six, seven, and eight. <laughs> weren't they? But weren't they shown early? No. Ah. I'm just happy you read the book. You don't have to impress <laughs> anyway, me. I, no, I, anyway, I don't remember what happened in the first issue. Maybe it's just showing any The first issue back. is just meeting Dane, uh, him being a rebellious teen, his teacher trying to, like, get him squared away, and then Dane getting uh, pulled into that, like, halfway house, basically, like the mm. reform school. Yeah. And, like, the, the bad guy with the dark glasses, like, trying to hollow him out and make him one of them, yeah, and then King Mob going in, shooting up the place, and rescuing him. But, I guess that wasn't that bad. <laughs> no, that was, I was, I was gonna say, I felt like that was like, oh, wow, there's a lot in this. That's yeah. like a movie, almost, right there. And then, I feel like it fucking pumps the brakes hard, and gives you three issues of nothing but Dane talking to this crazy homeless man about but, magic. But I, I liked it, though. I, I, I did, too. <laughs> I did, too. I just, like, I can see why people, like, if you're waiting month to month for this, you're like, what is happening? Yeah. They're just, it, it is just an excuse for Morrison to talk about magic, which I think is awesome. And to do that in, like, a mainstream comic and just throw out these really different ideas of, like, how to perceive the world, mm -hmm. like, that is really fucking ballsy. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. If, the, if you're going to throw these high concept ideas at me, you got to take your time. Yeah. Okay? you got to have a I'm crazy a simple man. Tom O'Bedlam. Yeah, yeah, Tom O'Bedlam. <laughs> you got a Tom O'Bedlam. If I don't understand it, he's going to try to drown me to make me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I need yeah. that. You're going to okay. fucking understand this, but uh, Tom's coming. Yeah. Because you're jumping off that building whether you want to or not. <laughs> yeah, another Matrix. Yeah. yeah. So, so far we're on the same page. I think what got you in the first issue is it starts strange of like, King Mob in some desert with like, and he finds like this beetle, like yeah. sca scarab, like the scarab thing. And then there's another part where King Mob randomly talks to John Lennon, the beetle. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so like, there is strange things tied up into that first issue where you could say it's all over the place. I personally really like the Tom uh, Obedlam stuff because it was like those issues were almost needed for someone who you know, hasn't read it before because. He, like, holds your hand through it. Yeah. Like, just as, like, he's doing Dane. But, like, right after that stops and they're done hand-holding, God have mercy on your soul kind of a thing. Because <laughs> then it gets wild really quick. Get in that windmill. Get Slash time machine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, okay. Yeah, like, that, okay, but before we get into that arc, 
there's we need to explore the magic stuff. Okay, the Tommy yeah, Bedlam stuff. Fair. Let's hold off on the Arcadia thing okay. until the later in the episode. First four issues, yes. I'm on board. Same. Okay. Didn't get the John Lennon Beetle thing. <laughs> I but can, now I, that you said Scarab and then Beetle thing, I'm like, is that connected? I don't know. Is it? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> See? Beetles. The first issue is called Dead Beetle. Mm-hmm. And the first line in the book is, and so we return and begin again. Speaks to the cyclical nature of this book. And You're gonna have to read this. Read a this again. Times. Yes. <laughs> the mummified beetle that mm -hmm. King Mob gets uh, alludes to humanity's current status right now. It's not doing great. <laughs> it's dead. It's buried. <sighs> And this reoccurring concept, both in this book and a lot of stuff that Morrison writes about, is time, the concept of time, is the soil for humanity to grow in. Mm. Let that sink in for a second. People grow and evolve over time. That is how we perceive human growth and change. You have a garden? It makes do. sense? Yes. It does. I'm fully tuned in right now. Uh, All right, I'm, 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 I'm finally I'm, on your way. Yeah. <laughs> we must pass through dark times, the soil, the ground, to develop the strength to grow and change. The reason we suffer is so that we can rebuild ourselves, to shake ourselves from complacency, change bad habits and patterns, become stronger, and to challenge authority and take control of our lives. Eventually, hopefully, all uniting to a common goal. Which, without getting too far ahead of ourselves, there is a common goal that this series is going towards. When Tom finally, like, provokes Dane to break down, like yeah. he's fucking drowning him in the river and <laughs> fighting him. Yeah. I think that is essentially just, like, to get him beyond his own ego. I mm -hmm. think his own personality to break him down to almost like a blank slate. Yeah. The blank badge. The... Uh, the symbol of the invisibles. Like, yeah. You're nothing. You can do anything from here. Mm -hmm. Everything you've encountered and everything the world's put into you is gone. Mm -hmm. And now you can finally, like, move forward. Mm -hmm. And it all kind of eventually climaxes with Dane taking, like, a leap of faith off a building and achieving this kind of enlightenment moment where he sees this planet this is barbalith which it doesn't you shouldn't know what this is but it is a term <laughs> it's a term that's referenced he sees it like graffitied on the subway wall and you're like what the fuck is this uh barbalith is you've seen 2001 space odyssey yeah it's kind of like the monolith of okay. that. It the is, name's about right. It is. It's got the same end <laughs> suffix. Is that it's what you call it? It's the same if. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like this thing, this object that is present to help people like get to the next evolutionary stage, I think, or the next stage of perception. He's just that ape. He is looking that at that barbalith. <laughs> Very much so, yeah. <laughs> looking at that bone to beat the other apes' heads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, like, the concept of barbalith or whatever it is, if it's a real thing or if it's just, like, this abstract concept, it is this, like, satellite, essentially, outside of time and space that helps humanity grow and helps him evolve in a lot of these moments of like change and revolution that thing is present there are a couple other characters in the story that also are almost like they kind of transcend this time and space concept they're there just to ensure that all the sides are playing their role to get humanity to its ultimate goal no matter what it is whether like someone's losing or someone's winning it's all part of the game and they have to go through these motions to get to that eventual outcome. Okay. So the game is on. These three issues are almost like exactly what Morrison describes in their article about like how to become a magician, that pop magic article. Mm -hmm. Tom ba sh opens Dane's eyes to the world of magic. And not like in a lame, pulling a rabbit out of a hat way, but just <laughs> like how you can perceive the world to get more out of it, to give your life more meaning. One of these things, which I don't know if I agree with, is uh, the power of belief, where Tom conjures a meal, basically, 
by like begging someone on the street. He's like, told you I'd get a meal. Here it is. Poof, magic. And he's like, yeah, that's not magic. He's like, but I said I would get it and I got it. Like, that's magic. He's like, well, what the fuck is magic then? Is that what, is magic just anything you can apply? And like, if you want to look at it that way, then yeah, I think it could be. But I feel like that's kind of a dangerous concept too. Yeah. I, I don't know if like that's the, like a great way to live life. I know. I, in that, it's like the vaguest sense of the word. Like, I, I, I put something into it and I got change. It kind of goes along with, like, the totems and the guillotine, and it's all, like, it's belief. It's how much you want to put into belief. Yeah. And I would say, like, that goes, that is absolutely what religion is, too. Oh, 100. Don't get me started on religion. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, like, a lot of, I feel like a lot of the things that Morrison is is preaching, for lack of a better term, like, enlightenment and finding, like, this, this, like, this super context, this great, like, almost heavenly thing that we're all achieving for, where, like... We have to go through shit on earth, this shit life, this mortal being, to achieve enlightenment in the next life. Like, that's fuck. That's the Christian view of heaven. Yeah. Yeah. But, like, I don't think Morrison is a Christian, but it's still, like, look at this. We all have, like, the same ideals of, like, what this greater utopia would look like. Yeah. And you can label it anything you want, but it's still that invisible language that we're all sharing, mm -hmm. which I think is interesting. I think that gets into, like, how much stock you want to put into... Labels? <laughs> labels or coincidence. How much do you want to give coincidence the benefit of the doubt kind of a thing? Like... Or even, like, labeling something as coincidence, too. Right, like, By right. putting a name on it, you're, like almost taking away the mystique or the power of it maybe not well that actually is kind of <laughs> that's actually kind of great i i like that <laughs> so yeah by like by being able to call it this you've just like segmented it and boxed it in the th yeah like you just calling it coincidence is that you just cutting corners then yeah essentially it's nothing. yeah it's like oh well this was happening because it was gonna happen but like doesn't have to be like that. Maybe it was supposed to happen. And you're just caught, like, you could call it coincidence, but was it? Mm. Just, like, I don't know. It's kind of, I get it. You're just like, oh, I got a big bread tomorrow and shit. <laughs> 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 I don't know. <laughs> this is the invisible. So it's, it's, like the say, yeah. it's just like, you, you could absolutely look at this and be like, this is a fucking waste of time. This is, like, philosophical bullshit that you can sit here and, like, debate and, like, try to, like, wrap your mind around when ultimately we have no idea and maybe none of it matters. But ultimately, I think it just comes down to, like, how do you want to interpret these things? And, like, does it make you happier or a better person in doing that? And if it doesn't, then, like, well, then fucking don't bother with it. But if it does, like, kind of just make you think more about how you perceive the world and how you interact with people and your actions, then, like, yeah, I think that is a, a, a good thing to think about. I will say, you're making bread for a great cause. Great for you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> like, hunger. <laughs> yeah. He's got a sweet gig. Don't let him, don't let him, don't let him fool you. I um, haven't said anything about it, but... <laughs> <laughs> At the very beginning of that, there's a street preacher, or like a lunatic, essentially on the streets, just doing the Alex Jones thing to a crowd. And keep in mind, this was written in the 90s, when, like, conspiracy theorists weren't inherently toxic. Yeah. This was the X-Files. They were giving, like, an amazing platform of the internet. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> they were just yeah. wackos on the street. Yes, yeah. and this is also, like, the X-Files era, where, like, it was fun to have conspiracy theories. <laughs> it's like, what was your favorite conspiracy oh, theory? Oh, fun. Yes. <laughs> and this guy, he's, like, in his megaphone or whatever, and he's like, when was the last time you had a thought that wasn't put there by them? This talks about, like, the element of control and the the reach of the controller on that where even if this person is not being controlled by the oppressor he believes he is thus he's controlled by them yeah it's a lot of that it's a lot of that in this so like mm -hmm. 
even if they're not controlling him, even if they're not putting thoughts in their head, he thinks they are. Thus, they are controlling him. What is, like, free will? A lot of shit, again, fucking drink every time we mention the Matrix. <laughs> it is a lot of that. What is free will? What is predeterminism? What is... What are you being controlled by that you don't know? What do you think you're being controlled by when you might not be? Thus, you are still. Mm -hmm. And I know you have bigger fish to fry than thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> I feel at any moment we are going to lose Troy on this. But I just, like, I think... I also love that I am the linchpin. <laughs> <laughs> the entire book club hinges on getting Troy completely turned to the cause on this. I am frankly astonished that you both enjoyed those three issues of Tom just walking around London telling Dane about magic. Mm -hmm. I thought that was where I was going to lose you right off the bat. <laughs> I wasn't, for whatever reason, I wasn't turned on by the first issue. I, maybe by the end, I'm like, ah, okay, it's gone. But like, the first introduction to King Mob, where he's like talking to that old lady in the apartment. Yeah. I'm like, who's this prick? Because I didn't realize he was in King Mob at first. He's like, I'm going to burn the city down. I'm like, this seems like a fucking cocksucker. <laughs> <laughs> like, why would anybody like him? I'm pretty sure that's King Mob in his yeah. spiky little coat. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but then he, like, doesn't seem like the same character when you meet him again later. I don't know. Like, he, the next time you see me, he, like, shoots a man in the face. So, like, <laughs> yeah, then you kind of get like, to know him a little bit I more. <laughs> King Mob undergoes some changes, some personality changes, and there is, like, some deep self-reflection with his character that I think is really interesting. Because right off the bat, he is, like, this cool, cold assassin. I say cool because that's how Morrison describes him. I also think he's a big old cocksucker. <laughs> I don't think there's anything cool about it, but apparently cool was the vibe they were going for. But, like, I fucking hate this dude. Yeah. And I also love that, like, when King Mob saves Dane... He's like, come on, I'm getting you out of here. And then they get out of there. He's like, all right, well, piss off. And fucking leaves him. <laughs> King Mob is a type of person that invites a friend over to their house like a little as a little kid. Yeah. And then when they get there, you act like you're too cool to play with them. What, are you, what are you doing here? I'm going to go play Super Nintendo and we got yeah. one controller. Sorry. <laughs> It's like, you fucking brought me here, dude. What do you want me to do? Oh, yeah. I was like, ah. my little brother. Figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what King Mob means? No. Yeah. It is the name of a uh, a London anarchist group from, like, the 60s or 70s. It's also, I find it funny that he would go and just spray paint his name on stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> <Yeah>. okay, cool. <laughs> I think we've established he's very cool. <laughs> yeah. Do you see those nipple rings? That aren't piercings. They're no. just rings that go around his nipples. He's not ready to make that full commitment yeah. yet. He's just trying yeah, it out on a belly shirt first. Shirt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I will say that like one thing that I thought was interesting, and this is explored later, like you're supposed to be rooting for this guy. Like he's he's your hero, essentially, or like the mentor. But when he saves Dane and guns down the guards. They're, like, begging for their life and, like, pleading and crying, and he's fucking obliterating them. And it's this point where it's like, Jesus, like, he's the good guy? <laughs> Jesus. I think that directly ties to people who would be, I guess, into anarchy and to kind of get a new revolution going. Flip that like, table. Flip mm -hmm. the table, like, yeah. Legs like, up. Like Jesus exactly. does. <laughs> Just like Jesus does. When he came in, everyone was last at that summer. dinner glass. Yeah. So flip this thing. Yeah, More exactly. fish? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But yeah, anybody who's a, a revolutionary, I think you have to, you're probably going to see that's the perspective of, at first of them being a villain. Because if you're in the society, you may not like the society, you may not have the guts or the balls to want to change society. Like, we're not always pleased with the government, but we're also like... What do you do? What can you do? Yeah. Really, we're just yeah. we're just want to make flip get, the capital yeah, over. Flip the, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they tried that. They, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you just take us for example, we're we are literally just three law-abiding citizens. <laughs> yes, That's, we are the zone for yourself. <laughs> oh, whoa, okay. <laughs> we're not out to overthrow anything. We just like I would say we're mostly just there to get by. I mean, I'm, I'll speak for you just for myself. Does that mean? I'm still, like, 
even though I don't think about it every day, I just want to move forward. I don't want to care about everything, all this other bullshit going on. I mean, like, I do care, but I'm like, you're such a small piece on this puzzle, like, what do you do kind of a thing, <clears throat> that you're just still under that control of that piece, whether you want to be or not. Yeah. I would say this book argues that most of us are under that control. It, yeah, that's what I'm getting to. even knowing it and also not being bothered by it. Yeah. Because, like, we're all pretty complacent for the most part. Yeah. And that isn't bad, but there are also things that are not good in the world. And, like, w obviously we're not going to, like, go and overthrow a regime or anything. Us but three, I, guys. Well, let's do it! I think... January <laughs> <laughs> Let's flip that capital for real this time. I think, like, the whole point of this is to just, like... <laughs> Rise of the Machines. <laughs> I would say that is a very central theme on this, and that's what uh, the second arc, Arcadia, deals with a lot in the whole revolution, mm. the, the French Revolution. Yeah. Uh, some of the characters talk about that, where, like, you forget how fucking horrible revolutions are, mm. and, like, how the revolutionaries sometimes end up being just as fucking awful as the people that they're trying to overthrow. Yeah. Like, the guillotine chapter, which I, we all fucking love a good guillotine, right? <laughs> Boy, do we. Yeah. <laughs> they're just talking, like, look at that. Like, they, they throw out all of the uh, the higher-ups, and then they just, like, fucking bloodthirsty animals are getting off on watching those heads get lopped off. And you're like, what are you doing? Like, you're no better than these people now. <laughs> yeah. As we go through these, I've got some themes that I want to touch on. Okay. Yeah. One of the big ones of this is uh, the us versus them mentality, where it's very much the Invisibles versus the outer church. Mm. This is kind of the concept of dualism versus monism. Okay. And that is uh, Manichian philosophy. Okay. I'm just waiting for that smile. <laughs> <I said. laughs> what is Manichian? It is uh, the principle of two opposing sides, and you cannot have one without the other. It's very much like you can't yeah. have chaos without order, because yeah. without order to rebel against, there's nothing to rebel. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't have anarchy without structure. Mm -hmm. So, like, the two sides complete each other, and without one, you can't have the other. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge huge principle of the invisibles huge. to the point where i would almost say it's a spoiler but it's going to come up so much that by the time we get to the ending it really shouldn't be like a shock anymore <laughs> yeah. there is a moment at the very beginning of arcadia the first issue of that arc where king mob is watching a puppet show mm -hmm. and there is a person that is creating this like shadow play this person is called the DeLong, I think, the DeLang, the DeLong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They really play this guy up. Yeah, they, they do. do. <laughs> well, let me just tell you, it's a, he's a kind of a big deal. <laughs> Not so much him, but this concept that he's, uh, he's showing here. Okay. And this puppeteer makes the audience see a war between two sides. And when in actuality, they are aspects of the same person. And the war itself is just a shadow play. Oh, okay. So as we discuss the two opposing sides mm -hmm. of this story, I'm going to turn it over to our guest lecturer here, Professor Cody Walker, to okay. share some insight, elaborate that a bit, maybe more than we can at our inebriated state, and uh, tell us a little bit about the war that's going on behind the scenes. I Hello. This is Mr. Walker. Let's talk about the war. The war in the Invisibles is between the Outer Church and the Invisible College. The war between control and chaos. So complete fascist totalitarianism and uh, complete independence. The war between the Invisibles and the Outer Church is interesting because how do you fight the idea of control? The nature of fighting control with individuality is impossible because you have to organize in order to defeat it. Uh, my students are reading 1984 and there's a moment near the end of the book where the idea is, is floated that it's just, it's impossible for the proletariat to rise up against 
the bourgeoisie um, or against the party in that book because the party is control and the proletariat is allowed to do whatever they want. And so they would never be able to organize. And even if you did, even if you started to organize, isn't that also the nature of control, at least in the furthest extremes? So with the invisibles, there's no overarching organization. There are small five person organizations that represent the five different um, elements. And so if you aren't familiar with them, it's just Captain Planet. So earth, fire, wind, water, heart, or human spirit. These small cells are going to work against the, the higher order of, of, of order itself, of fascist control. It's so interesting to think about because we all want to view ourselves as being like, oh, I'm against the control, but I'm a high school teacher. <laughs> How am I not a part of the control? How am I not part of the machine that puts students into a place of complacency? Like I try to get them to think critically about their government and about their media and about life, big things. But am I just a cog in the larger machine of, of control and thought? And so the beginning of Invisibles, of course, Dane is going to blow up his school because for kids, this is it. This is the, this is totalitarianism for them. But also education is so important. Students can be educated on their own, but they so often don't want to be. It, it's so much easier to give in to all of the other noise. So it's just interesting to think about is how can we as individuals be a part of a larger society and still be rebelling against it by its nature. That's not, that's not really possible, at least in the terms of what we're talking about in, in invisibles. The other thing that's worth noting is, is that both of these are the furthest extremes, right? That the outer church is the furthest extreme of control and the invisibles are the furthest extreme of, of chaos. There's even a metaphor in Arcadia where they talk about the, the puppets talking to each other, but it's the same puppet master. And so we're supposed to ask ourselves as we read the invisibles, like who is the puppet master between both of these? Is there one? Are the outer church and the invisibles just playing out parts in a play? Or are all of the conflicts that we see within this book or throughout history are they playing out the parts of the outer church and the invisible college? Is that happening in the French revolution where it's just a part of this ongoing conflict between control and chaos, or maybe we shouldn't say chaos. Maybe we should say individual rights, individuality depends on one's perspective. I suppose on which word we use, it's just worth considering what are the sides that are, are at play in this. And where do we fit in that? I want to say that I'm an individual and that I encourage individuality, but can I, when I work in a system? More questions than answers, I guess. But that's how the book should be. Speaking of freedom versus control, Dane is not a good person. No. Right? He's a piece no, of shit. He's, yeah. He's a punk. I mean, he's a young punk. He's, he's ignorant, but like, in the defense of control from any normal person, you wouldn't want this kid like going around Molotoving your car. Right? <laughs> yeah. So it's like they're like realistically, people like this can't just go around doing whatever they want. Right. Yeah. And that is something like the, the invisibles, like they seem cool, but like they're fucking maniacs too. <laughs> you know, like yeah. a lot of this is just like who's the worst maniac? Yeah, you know? Right. Is it the people that are like keeping society under control or is it the ones that are like blowing shit up and lighting stuff on fire? Yeah. Like they're both kind of awful. <laughs> yeah. They're both very, very different extremes. Yeah. But what I liked about the, the Dane stuff <laughs> is that he fucking mall topped all those. No. <laughs> uh, is that the, the thing that balances that out for me though, for Dane is like, yeah, he's a punk, but like his 
life as a kid is awful. His father's missing, gone, just not there. And his mother wants nothing to do with him and kicks him on the street. And he's like, oh, but it's cold. Don't give a shit. Get the fuck out. I have I'm this dude coming later. over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's just like... Oh, like when you don't get that nurtured feeling and like you get like this, just kick, like he's got nowhere else to go. And even his friends are kind of like, you're kind of, you're going a little too hard, man. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. this is like too much. You, you went too hard in the mall talk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's <laughs> like, yeah, I, I went all in on mall talk. Went all yeah. in. Yeah. <laughs> mall talk day, they call me. Yeah. It's so, odd that they call him Jack Frost when he throws all those black bombs. <laughs> <laughs> I think, like, the true hero that, like, is overshadowed by all of this is Dane's fucking teacher that is trying to just, like, educate him. He, like, he says, like, Dane, like, Nazis burn books. Mm -hmm. As yeah. he's gonna burn the school. He's like, what are you doing? Like, yeah. you're not that. Mm -hmm. But it's like, you're just taking it too fucking far, man. You just need to, like, open your eyes a little. <laughs> yeah. Someone who's got that compassion to actually kind of show him the way, but not, like, tear his life down. Like, trying to turn what he is and what he knows into something more constructive rather than destructive. Yeah. Well, I've got good news. That guy, he gets Key. kicked in the mouth is what he gets. <laughs> that's, that's not the good news. Oh. <laughs> but he does get that. Uh, he makes another appearance later on. Good. Mouth okay? His mouth great. No, Better than ever. Once Dane is recruited, he's being trained by Boy, and they're doing like some jiu-jitsu stuff. Mm -hmm. little, another little Matrix little thing. Little kung yeah. fu. It's interesting because the invisible cell that he's in is wholeheartedly dedicated to the war, mm -hmm. despite none of them really knowing any specifics about it. <laughs> like, they yeah. don't know exactly who they're rebelling against. It's just like, you know, against control. And he's like, but what control? And she's just like, good question. And that, Hiya! Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, how do I know I'm on the right side? And she's like, I guess you don't. And it's just like, everyone there, everyone is in the invisible cell is just like, they just want to fucking fight. But they don't even really understand what they're fighting for. Everyone is just so eager to be combative rather than trying to understand, like, why are we this way? And how mm. can we change something? Okay. It's almost like these two structures, the Invisible College and the Outer Church. It's almost like those things do just need to exist on the extremes. So, like, everything in between can have, like, harmony while they just, like, butt heads and just... Is this where we harmonize? <laughs> ah! Got Holy it. shit, <laughs> boys! <laughs> And it's interesting, too, because, like, the Invisibles are also just kind of soldiers following orders. Yeah. They don't really know where it's coming from. They're just like, hey, we got a mission. We got to go back in time to get the Marquis de Sade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, like, in comparison, like, how big is the Outer Church compared to the Invisibles, then? You just assume any type of authoritarian control is at least infiltrated by the Outer Church. Because I... Whereas also, like, the Invisibles are a lot of just free thinkers and revolutionary people, like in the Arcadia arc, uh, Shelley and Byron, mm -hmm. I think you would say they were part of the Invisibles, whether they knew it or not. Yeah? Well, now that you... Troy's, <laughs> Troy's grimacing. <laughs> Troy didn't like the poets. Is what he said. No, I didn't. I didn't like the poets. I didn't like him at all. Every time they were on, I'm like, a snooze fest. So, literally, I fell asleep many times <laughs> during that. They cut around to different spots, and granted, a lot of the, uh, the invisibles are kind of scattered about amongst at this point. But it's also like, they're telling the story about these gross-ass group. And they're all just, like, doing weird bang stuff and yeah. orgies and <laughs> gross. Like, I don't know. It's just, like, it's the it's like they got that terrible thing going on. And King Mob, who's there, is just like, yeah, I can't wait till this is over. We'll have to sit and watch this all. Like, why? You better well, get it over with. Exactly. You killed somebody for less. <laughs> yeah. So, like, there's that. There's the, the poets that, like, when they... I... If you have something about the poets in your notes, please say it because I, I have a shit ton about. Because, oh my okay, God. So I, I, I want to hear it. I want to hear it just because I 
that's one thing I I didn't pull much from because I'm like, what? I don't I don't necessarily know what they're doing here. I couldn't find where they connect to like the main story other than to make it like more literary. And I'm like, honestly, I don't give a fuck about yeah. that fucking book. We already talked about, about the Shakespeare <laughs> version of Sandman. It wasn't our favorite theory. Okay. So, okay, so I think this is a part of the book that you get way more out of on your second or, in my case, third read. Okay. Because that was probably my favorite part of this Oh, boy. <laughs> so the poets tie into the concept, one of the themes of this, of, like, reality versus fiction. Okay. What is truly real and how that can shape the world. In the sense that those writers are very much kind of doing what the Invisibles are doing, but they're not doing it with force. Uh -huh. They're doing it with words and trying to inspire change. I'm just going to go through a couple bullet points that I've given mm -hmm. myself mm -hmm. here. Starting with Tom, some of his quotes, Tom O'Bedlam, saying, like, yes. everything that happened to you is real, even your dreams, them most of all, because dreams shape who you are mm -hmm. and, like, the way you view the world, just like fiction, maybe even more than, like, actual real things. Mm -hmm. Like, what you believe and how you perceive something overshadows, like, facts and data mm -hmm. lots of times. Mm -hmm. They're making the argument that the distinction between dream and reality is unimportant if it evokes true emotion or change in a person. So they, Shelley and Byron, the two poets, talk about this a lot. They see their role as to inspire humanity and to show humanity that a better world can exist. They think, like, that's their job and their duty. And you could say the exact same with Morrison on their view of superheroes. Like, Grant has said many times, like, yeah. Superman is, like, Jesus. Essentially, yeah. like, Superman inspires you to be a better person yeah. by what they represent. And that concept outlives anything real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Shelley confronts the truth that despite him championing for a utopia... He ignores his own family and his daughter ends up dying. It's kind of saying, like, it's easy to get caught up in dreams for a better world while completely missing the importance of also what is right in front of you. Mm -hmm. And he's, like, championing for a better world, but it's like, well, if you're always doing that, then what are you fighting for? Because mm -hmm. you're getting no satisfaction out of life. Like a soldier, if you're always at war, mm -hmm. what, like, you're not experiencing the joy that you're fighting for. Saying writers remake the world with words and the images of their dreams. Saying that fiction is often considered like a diversion from reality when in fact it could be like a blueprint or a code to rewrite our own perception of reality and thus create a better world going forward. And it's interesting because his wife, Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein, mm -hmm. says like, yeah, but then the rest of us must live in it. So whoever puts down that fictional blueprint changes how everyone else lives going forward. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting because she's, like, always played second fiddle to him, mm -hmm. and she created Frankenstein, which some would say is, like, one of the very first instances of, like, artificial intelligence. And that has gone on to fucking create the future of where we're at right now. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, that's a really interesting concept. And all this is like, yeah, maybe it's a stretch, but it's all... Morrison is very big on, like, it's just how you perceive things. Yeah. That's right here, there. Oh, I was you. perceiving it, and it was bothering me. <laughs> <laughs> I've been talking a lot. Do you guys have any notes? Well... Does that, I mean, does that make their role that a little makes more it, interesting? Yeah. It makes it... I get... Saying that makes it more interesting, but when going back to read it, it does not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just like them... Faffing about <laughs> There's talking a lot of about faffing. poetry and like how cool it is, and I'm like, okay, what's going on with our main characters? Mm -hmm. Like, what they were just in a windmill. They're watching <laughs> this whole bang session go on. <laughs> <behind these creepos. laughs> I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, do you know what the bang session is? Uh, it was a fucking horrible to read. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, it was. It is. It is a story. It's 120 days of Sodom. Oh, shit. The story that Marquis de Sade wrote. Oh, was it? Oh, yeah. okay. So okay. you've probably okay. heard of that movie, Salo. Yeah. 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 It is that. Like, that movie was an adaptation 
uh, put through the lens of like this Italian dictatorship, but it was a story that the Marquis de Sade wrote while he was imprisoned, and it was all about like basically the people in power taking a bunch of young kids to a castle and being able to do whatever they wanted, and that's what they do. Like, all the rulers of government, bank, everything. <laughs> when the Invisibles travel back in time to get the Marquis de Sade, it's a thing that happens. Yeah. They, like, take they a They go wrong, to a windmill. Yeah, they yeah. take a wrong turn <laughs> and end up in this fictional story that the Marquis de Sade wrote. And they're just like, what the, what the fuck do we do here? Yeah. And they're just like, I guess we just gotta wait till they finish, <laughs> and then we can move on. <laughs> But that is, like, just kind of an, an analogy for what the outer church and all the people in power are doing. Like, this is what will happen if no one challenges this. Yeah. It's almost like they just take humans and turn them into products that they can just fuck and do whatever they want to. Yeah. And by the end of this, what they encounter in the story is, like, they just, they run out of things to do, so they're like, it's just fucking kill the world. And they, like, they push the doomsday button and blow everything up. Mm -hmm. They don't have the imagination to do anything outside of their own, like, what to do with fucking flesh in front of you. Mm -hmm. So we have to stop them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Marquis de Sade there is just like, holy shit, you guys seeing this? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, this is what I wrote about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm a weird guy, yeah. yeah. So the whole last four issues of this run here, mm -hmm. it, I, I would say was not as enjoyable for me as, like, the first couple of them. Uh-huh. Uh, it took me a, a strange, strangely long amount of time to get through <laughs> these. I don't know why, but, like, it just, it seemed to slow way down, but then in points really peak my interest and then crash completely. Yeah. Like, it was all over the place for me. I, so, like, I really enjoy Doom Patrol, right? Yeah. And, like, the fact that, like, the group of the Invisibles, they go and, like, hey, let's go to this windmill. It's a time machine. And I'm like, great. I'm all in. It's weird for weird sake alone. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Let's form a seance and, like, fucking let's travel back in time. I'm all in on yeah. that idea. Mm -hmm. I can uh, I can grasp that just strange concept. Yeah, I mean, one of these space station middle fingers. But then when they're all split up, like, it depended on where I landed in that story yeah. on how engrossed I was in it. Now, I'm going to tell you, I was engrossed in far less than I was <laughs> in the ones I was into. I totally get that. I think that uh, that arc, the Arcadia arc, is a very dense and challenging read. Yeah. And yeah. I like that is one of the ones that I think almost killed the series when it was out. But that arc is, like, the best analogy for like where the entire series goes in terms of like the themes that it presents like, okay like it just it seems like what is this even about why are we reading this yeah until you like read through the whole thing and then if you come back to it you're like oh i i totally get like what this is saying sure okay so i know like that on your first read that is not like <laughs> oh i want to keep going yeah. Yeah. i will say it picks up from here but Good. having read this multiple times, I fucking loved this arc because oh, it God. just like it made it like s there were so many hints of like what this whole thing is about okay. in this one. So King Mob and Boy, it, this is that's where they were. They were with the uh, Dusad, yeah, seeing this whole creepy thing go down. Yeah, what I actually liked the other two bits quite a bit more, mostly because like it wasn't like. Just like off putting. It is like, it is horrible. Yeah. Like the yeah. shit that happens in this castle is despicable. The entire point is that it's supposed to be the fucking worst thing that people could come up with to do to somebody. Yeah. And it's supposed to be atrocious. Yeah. And, and it is. And, yeah, exactly. yeah. And it is like, it is very <laughs> off putting to read. Yeah. Especially with King Mob like making snide comments yeah. about yeah, it. Yeah, the whole exactly. Time. And that doesn't like, as the first. You call that fucking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're all like astrally projecting into yeah. these yeah, they, into other times. We should mention they don't actually go back. Yeah, they don't time. travel. They, back. Like they, it's a full on Doctor Strange astral yeah. projection. They are still sitting in the windmill. Dane and Fanny get kicked back into their. They wake into their up own bodies. into their own bodies. But there's a man with a scribbly face there, <laughs> and yeah. like. 
Orlando. Orlando. The fleshless. Yes. He's a creep and also, like... <laughs> got a scribbly face. Got yeah. a scribbly face. As soon as Dane's waking up, he's cutting off, like, his fingers. I actually kind of like this aspect that they take the guy who's brand new to the group and just putting him through the ringer to see how they can convince him to keep going along the same path. And it... Uh, by the eight issues, like, you, he's he wants out of it. He's done. And Fanny shows himself to be awesome. <laughs> like, in this, Dane is so out of his element. He wants to just like, oh, fuck, where's the closest gun I can get? Oh, King Mob's got a gun. He's like, oh, I fucking never used a gun before. And he's like, get to fuck. Get to fuck. <laughs> and then does shoot him, but like, to no avail. But Fanny, who's been through this all, like, you think that he, they get done in. Like, get, uh, gets uh, cut. But then takes off their fake tits because yeah. like they're uh like they're trans yeah. and they're like cross dressing so they're yeah. not real or yeah. whatever and they're like these were fucking this was these a six five hundred dollar pair of sunglasses yeah. you son of a bitch like <laughs> these were like super expensive and stuff uh, and these were Italian yeah <laughs> so I think this is where it kind of elevates in that magical level again of like how do I process this kind of thing so right like fanny is a, a shaman essentially yeah and able to like summon god so fanny is saying all of like oh they, they're like aztec death gods all of these it's very strangely named yeah <laughs> i'm sure real death gods from a, a bunch of different cultures and just fucking like Lays waste. Yeah, down. it's like in the business. Gives him some business. Like <laughs> somebody just opened the ark and he melted. Kind yeah. of thing. Like yeah. turns into like this fucking hell beast. Gets him to fuck. I want to touch on also where Ragged Robin ended up going because yeah. I liked this, but I think I was just below the point where I'm like, I get this. I think I just need a little bit more motivation to kind of understand where this one was going. So she goes to this like. T like uh, um, a church a church, church like an old cathedral and this is where all like you also see more of these like oh uh, gas masked up goons or whatever all like <laughs> cypher men cypher men and they're all they eat guts and stuff i don't know what they, they do <laughs> they don't even eat it they just like to touch just them. like pick through it and stuff <laughs> they're just a bunch of little dorks yeah so ragged robin goes in there uh there's a man playing chess outside and there's some dialogue between them that's probably more yeah, that man may Grandiose. Be, maybe Satan. Excellent. I didn't pick that up. <laughs> no, you wouldn't you wouldn't have this so, book. I don't know if I ever picked it up until this book. <laughs> okay, got it. Well that actually, now that you say that, might make this a little more sense. So but like there's apparently like a head of a old Templar or it's something. John the Baptist. Yeah. Who was a prophet in the Jesus era. You know, the Jesus times. <laughs> exactly. He, he was a prophet. We, so we were, the, talking we're about flipping, flipping tables. tables. Yeah. Oh, like, man. He flipped it on John the Baptist. <laughs> oh, my like, man. Oh, 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 shit. <laughs> so, yeah. he They have the head of John the Baptist. And they're like, he's going to fucking tell us what, what we want to hear. Yeah. And that is all it does. It just tell It speaks in tongues. And people only hear what they want to hear out of it. Yeah. So I, I like that bit that they came out knowing like, oh, this is just false prophet shit you're yeah. getting from this. Like, there's nothing important coming out. Because it's like spouting off like pop music and shit like that. The yeah, second but it's funny because the Cyphermen only hear orders. Yeah. And they say like, that's all they want. Like, they're just hollow. They don't want to think. They just want to be told what to do. And that is like the entire outer church control. Like, it just, it just needs to tell people how to behave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I liked, actually, that was, like, the sticking point as Robin figured out, oh, it's just telling you what you want to hear. So You think it's this big thing, and it's yeah. like a red herring. And, and yeah. she just fucking leaves. She's like, actually, I don't want I don't anything care. to do with it. Yeah. I, I like that her frame of thought is like, shut the fuck up, guys. Shut Like, your little pointy little goony weapons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> your little zap guns. <laughs> yeah. your, little, your little fucking shop of horrors, like, little fucking trinkets here trying to cut me up. I'm not even real, bitch. Like, yeah. yeah. Try yeah. to fucking... Yeah. They're like, yeah. they're the flying through the room. Yeah. Yeah. And John the Baptist is like, yeah. And then she fucking yeah. just, like, vanishes. She's gone. Robin leaves and talks with this mysterious chess player mm -hmm. who's playing a solo game of chess. White and black, both sides of the board. Maybe he has no friends. That's very much it. <laughs> Would you be friends with Satan? 
Do I don't know. He's killing less like... people than God. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like the, the head's just telling people what they want to hear, but then Satan and Robin chat. They say that what he says is actually the original language. They say, like, it's speaking in tongues, it's the first language, and they describe it as unconscious speaking to the unconscious, and they dub it invisible speech. And basically, it's like, everyone hears what they want to hear, but it's also, like, it's what they need to hear, and they say it's, like, the most direct form of communication and understanding. Hmm. So it's almost like what they hear removes any disconnect from people. Like, okay. it, it's almost like it removes any language barrier, any understanding barrier. So, like, when they said that, I was like, oh, is, is this important? I honestly don't remember. I don't remember if this plays a role. <laughs> yeah. But I feel like they talk about, like, this is important. This is, like, what you would need to shape a better world is just this, like, eliminating miscommunication. Cutting the bullshit. Yeah, because everyone just takes perceives things differently, and this was like a way to just like cut right to the core. Okay. It, so, and I guess Robin just wanted to fucking hear some '80s tunes. Yeah. <laughs> and the Cyphermen just wanted to be told what to do, and it, it's easier to have like an enemy to fight than to claim like any agency for yourself and like have to actually control your own destiny. It's like, mm -hmm. just tell me who to fight and what to do. Yeah. So with that being said, I kind of I kind of like that. Uh, because like, if it's, if it's tell, if it's just eliminating language barriers, like, and it's telling everything that you need to hear, like what anyone needs to hear is all completely different depending on your, obviously your, your perspective. So like you're on one side and you're, or you're on the other, you might be, be told opposite things, but to get to the same yeah. synchronous point. Yes, very much. That's in my notes. Neil, you are... Move to the head of the class. Fuck you, Troy! <laughs> I figured I'd do Tom, you're anyway. like, Tom will Bethlehem, bring them back! <laughs> bring me back, Tom! <laughs> oh, okay. So, can I go to the bathroom? Yes, quick? I have to pee too. <laughs> yeah, I kind of do as well. I want to have one of your uh, Millers. Oh, bring another one in there too, because I need something light to drink. These are going to put me over the edge, I think. How many did you drink? It's only like my third beer. I'm, I'm only on three, too, but for whatever reason, I'm really feeling it here. Okay. Uh, coming back from our... We had a little uh, potty break here. <laughs> Took a pause. Let everyone stretch their legs. Um, fuck, what was the last... What were we talking it about? It was the... When the Invisibles travel back through time, they do so because they received, like, instructions to go back to the French Revolution and pick up an undisclosed member of the Invisible College. Yeah. And they get there and they don't know who it is and they find out it is the Marquis de Sade. Mm. Notable, awful person, the <laughs> Marquis de Sade. <laughs> yeah. Who wrote about all these horrible things, like 120 Days of Sodom and all these things. But I don't... Like, he didn't do these things, I don't think. Like, no. he's, he's a notorious pervert and weirdo but uh, like aren't we all exactly <laughs> and in the way that morrison frames it like yeah here's this person that is like we know him as this awful person but like at that time what he was writing about was rebelling against like the monarchy at that point and he was imprisoned for like 15 or 20 years because of just his ideas mm -hmm. So, like, he was very much, like, I guess, kind of like a member of the Invisible College. Like, he was this free-thinking radical. Yeah. And I guess it's kind of interesting to take this character that has always been, like, vilified in culture and be like, actually, this guy is going to, like, reshape the world for the better. Because they bring him to the present, or they bring, like, an astral projection of him, and they're like, you're going to change the world. And it, he... Uh, that is his job. He sets out, and we don't see him again for a long time, but he does come back at some point in the series. Okay. And it's interesting because, like, the way we leave it, I think the last issue ends with a young prostitute getting picked up under a bridge. It's Marquis de Sade, and he's like, come with me. We're gonna have, like, we're gonna fucking rewrite the future right, right now. <laughs> yeah, a, a lot of that. <laughs> But the whole thing is, like, it's not, it's going to be with consent. Like, that is the big difference. Whereas, like, they're going to do their own weird pervert castle thing that he wrote about, 
but instead of people with power lording it over the the paupers and everything, it's going to be this free love idealist utopia where like everyone is going to be in unison on it. Okay. And it's not going to be like I'm fucking fucking you. <laughs> you're going to take it because I want you to take it. It's like you're going to take it because you want to take it. <laughs> There's places like that that already exist, I'm sure. Well, that is it, because like when they take him to the future, they go to that S&M club, yeah. and he's like fucking in heaven. Yeah. And he's like, oh my god, this is this is what I dreamed about. <laughs> There's actually one bit. He's like walking upstairs and sees walk, someone walk by, and he's like, the fuck? Well, that's it. It's like that. the S&M uh, atmosphere is authority and submission but it's this understanding between the two it isn't like authority presupposing its role on the submissive it's like we've entered a contract and we're both okay with this yeah yeah like on paper it looks like oh this is what they're fighting against but no it's it's what they both want mm -hmm. and king mob even says at one point he's like like the biggest trick that we're trying to pull off is going to result in everyone getting exactly the type of world they want Everyone, including the enemy. Yeah, I love the concept of that. Like, realistically, in today's world, I have a hard time boiling that down to a truth. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, yeah. I I love the sentiment. But yeah. it's just, and maybe that's because I still need work, too, okay? <laughs> we all do. But it's just like, man... There's some real fucking shitty idiots out there. So it's like, again, that's what this is trying to, to, to get everyone past. It's like that exact feeling of how could I relate to this person or this person regarding, like, yes. for anything. And Beyond any, like, preconceived biases. Right. I think ego and it, personality yeah. and all of these things that have, like, entered into your consciousness and how you view the world. It's like get all of that garbage and noise out of the way. And essentially everyone kind of just wants the same thing, right? Like they just want yeah. happiness or understanding or some kind of utopia. And that is essentially what everyone is striving for. They're just going about it in different ways. Right. I can't even see where that thread goes. Like I can, I can't even tell you like someone who has completely different like aspects from me like, it would be hard for me to, like, find that connective tissue to make something in a world where we would both want to be. An interesting thought experiment. That I That is what this book is. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, now, that you, now that we've got eight issues under the belt, you kind of know the vibe of this. And that it it's not so much about the story as it is about, like, just making you think about, like, deeper concepts, I think. And I think your enjoyment is completely based on, like, how much you want to think about that. Mm-hmm. Like, it is not a, a Batman book. You right. know? It's like, right. you don't read it and have fun and forget it. You read it and you don't really have fun, and then you think about it for a while, oh. and you're... No, sorry. <laughs> for, from my perspective on these first eight issues, what's hard about that initially, and what we can agree on for Sandman, is that once we three started talking about it, we were like, holy shit, like... Why is this now my favorite thing? Because I hated reading this. <laughs> but like, once coming through and hearing your perspective and your perspective, we like we all like found this new meaning for these Sandman books where we're like, all of it's really great. It just has like its different things. So right now, that's I'm kind of sitting with that for these where it's like the text on the page, as I, as I would read it, doesn't like provoke things initially where it's like i need that little like bug in my ear to tell me like hey this is kind of where it need you kind of got to get in your headspace because like the poet stuff like up until now like mm -hmm. i just kind of read that i'm like i just i don't I, get what they're saying yeah like, you don't know like what does this mean yeah to the story as a whole yeah and i completely get that and i want it like i guess like coming from a person who just reads Batman books and shit. You know, like, you're... I, I want it to make sense in that context of the story where it just it just doesn't 
for the time being, and it's just like a hurdle. That's where I get hung up as of right now, but like, it's these discussions that are gonna kind of help me, like, cross those barriers. Yeah. And I would say, like, the stuff they're talking about is interesting, mm. but the fact that, like, where does it fit into this book where they're time-traveling and fighting the outer church? You're like, yeah. this seems like something that doesn't mean anything to the story that I'm reading, when in fact, like, what they're talking about is the story. Yeah. And, like, the time-traveling and all that shit, that's, like, the background noise. And I think, like, that becomes more clear the further you go, and if you revisit it again. Mm -hmm. Because, like, when I read this the very first time, probably, like, ten years ago, I was like, I don't know what the fuck this is. <laughs> but when I finished it, I was like, I don't know if I liked it, but, like, I can't get it out of my head. Okay. And then when I read it again a couple years later, I was like, oh, my God, like, this makes so much more sense to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is an experiment. <laughs> yeah. I would say more so than any other thing we've read for, like, a book club. But I, like, I've said it on record. I think this is, like, one of the most influential books I've ever read. And I did not love it the first time. But I think it's something that, like, the more you think about, you will gain a deeper appreciation of it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not loving it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, there are points of it I do like. And it... It hits those peaks, and I'm like, I, I want it to continue on those. Uh -huh. And it's probably more of, like, the generic, straightforward stuff. The heady stuff, like, I can't see forward yet. I right. don't know what's to come. So I'm kind of just, like, putting it out of my mind. So when, like, I'm getting through some stuff that I don't... I, I'm like, I don't see how this pertains to anything of the story. I'm blowing through it, or I'm literally, like... My yeah. tablet is falling out of my hand because I'm falling asleep. Yeah. Like, this was not my favorite read. Like, comparing it to any other book clubs, and even, like, Grant Morrison works, like, I feel like I know enough about Grant Morrison that I can take from their life and try to interpret it into the story. But even then, like, I'm still not sure... How much I like this little chunk of it. What I will, if we're, like, as far as comparing Grant Morrison's other writings to this, I'm going to take All-Star Superman just as an example. That concept that he's getting across there, I think it's just really easy to, like, understand. Mm. Like, just essentially a perfect good. A cent, oh, something <laughs> like that. Where it's, I, I, like, the goal, the motive... The, the symbol, everything, you know, like... This is what we should this strive is to be. Yeah, and, and, like, it helps that it's Superman. If that gets abstract, like, it kind of does in that book. Like, he, yeah. there's stranger things that happen yeah. in, from any other Superman book that go on in that. But it's, like, you still can keep that connection. Whereas, like, I feel you here where it's, like, I can't, like, connect these characters or what's this going to, like... It's, they're just going out to things that are beyond my sight kind of thing. So for me to retain all of this knowledge that I've taken already, I'm not going to remember <laughs> I'm not going to remember every single detail going forward. So I'm going to need somebody to hold my hand going That's, forward. That is what we're trying to do here. Because mm -hmm. it, I know if I just said, like, Troy, go home with your three kids in your busy life. Read 59 issues of Invisibles and tell me what you think about it. I'm like, no. I don't think you'd ever talk to me again. <laughs> Local man jumps off a bridge. <laughs> Achieves enlightenment. <laughs> that is why I haven't wanted to do another episode on this until, like, I've really thought about this. Like, I've taken a lot of fucking notes on this, and I'm rereading this and this and, like, watching videos. And, like, I'm trying to hold hold both your hands and any viewers that want to hold my hand <laughs> on this. I'm not an expert, but I'm just like, I've, I've read it. This is my third time. So like, I know what to look for and I know like how I suddenly like kind of, how it opened my eyes in certain aspects mm -hmm. and without spoiling anything, I'm just trying to like point you where to look and where to focus on. And yeah. so like, I have, I don't want to do any supplementary material. Yeah, and that's I fine. don't because I want to go in how this was initially released and yeah. like how I guess I would be the general public mm -hmm. on how to 
received that. That is actually I the guess. take I kind of want to do too. Granted, I watched. I will like, say you will yeah. both like it a lot less. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've put in I put in a little of extra credit work or whatever through like watching like documentaries and Cody Walker's been a you know a good asset on that part too. But like he's just putting like he's just setting down the first Legos, you know, mm-hmm. and like you, we have to finish the rest. Yeah, that kind of thing. Also, I found out I'm not great at Legos either. <laughs> well, like, here's the other thing. I can't even follow instructions. It's really simple instructions. I need to re- somebody. I need the instructions. I can't just free form that shit. Yeah. But like, when I first read this, I probably felt very much like you, where I'm like, I don't even know if I like this. I don't know where it's going or what it's trying to say. Turns out, it's trying to say everything. Yeah. And by the end of it, even if you don't get it, you might want to return to it just because there's certain things, if I can quote the Matrix, that stick like a splinter in your mind, where it's just like, I don't know what that was, but like, there's a couple things that like, I just feel like I need to read up more on, or I need to just like wiki something, or just learn what the fuck was this all about, and I think like, you just go down like a rabbit hole there, it's like, okay, what the fuck, what what was the Marquis de Sade all about? Oh, he wrote 120 Days of Sodom. Oh, that's what they were doing here. The Ark is called Arcadia. I didn't know what the fuck that meant. And they show that postcard of this famous old painting. Mm-hmm. That painting, apparently, is the very first time that um, the concept of knowing that you're going to die was ever illustrated. That picture that they get is this painting of three people in this idyllic paradise at, like, a gravestone. So, like, okay, now I know about that. And it doesn't really play a huge role into this, but it's still just like, you know, the idea of paradise comes with the knowledge that death is present. Mm -hmm. And that like, you know, even in the best of times, there's still death. And even like the championing for a better world comes at a cost. And all of this that like, it isn't directly related, but it just paints this broader picture of these really interesting concepts. And that's one of the things I love about Morrison, because it's a fucking weird trippy spy book but like i'm learning about all this shit that i didn't even know about before that Mm -hmm. and that is the most interesting thing to me by the end of the series all these other things that like i picked up Mm. you know just like how you perceive the world can change based on some fictional thing Mm. yeah well thing here so there's a moment and it's like the it's like kind of the matrix moment where there's the red pill, blue drink pill. For, yeah, the drink for every matrix. But yeah, yeah. this is a very red pill, blue but pill type of thing. Yeah, exactly. It, so I want, I just like to imagine Troy in that scenario or in this scenario where they're like, Dane, you Troy drinks a whole jar of blue pills. <laughs> He's like, Dane, you follow us or you don't. You walk through this door and we'll show you everything. If not, you're 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 just gone or whatever. We're finding somebody else, kind of thing. And then I could just be like. You just being like, well, okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> no, it would be it would be the Midwestern like, well, well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. actually, it's been oh, fun. I guess I'll, just, I'm gonna see my yeah. way out. All oh, right, actually, oh, let me get squeezed oh, right past yeah. here. <laughs> this has been much longer than I anticipated it. Even with my notes trying to keep us on track, I feel like we just kind of had to free flow this. This had to lay a lot of groundwork. They're still mm-hmm. big concepts, but they're, I feel like they're a little bit more like tuned to the storyline. Okay. This sets a stage. And I would say the next volume, I think, is might be my favorite of the bunch. Okay. Like, you get a lot more character development in that one. This one, I will say, it is very lacking on characters. It is way more high concept ideas that you have no idea what they mean or where they go. Yes. This is, this <laughs> is a very difficult introductory arc. Yep. We stuck with it. We put in the time. I just, I wanted to give you the groundwork because I think you will like it more in as it goes on. And then I think there's a period where you might like it less. <laughs> but we're going to get through it. Fingers crossed. Awesome. Yep. If we get anything out of this from this reading and viewers at home, if you're still with us after this, it is just to like, just think a little more about things. And... It may not lead to anything. No, but just like being more open-minded about stuff, I mm-hmm. think is is very positive. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's just, it's little changes. And I, I know myself personally, I've had some things going on that have 
completely changed my perception of my entire reality, <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. And it has made me, I feel, like a better person because of some crazy changes that mm -hmm. are happening and I don't know how it'll work out but I just I know it has had an effect and it also coincidentally coincided with us reading the invisibles a book about <laughs> like major change so like that has been in the back of my head and it's just been one of those things where it's like I'm just like trying to see things from a slightly different perspective than I normally do this is just it is one of those moments where, like, fiction can implement a change in reality. Mm -hmm. And maybe not everyone's reality, but for that person that's reading it, it can inspire positive growth. Yeah. So that's been the first class. Oh, my God. Yeah. Of the Invisible College. This is worth three credits. So it's a big, <laughs> it's a big job. This is an AP class. Yeah. This one yeah. Is. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Get as much as you can out of it because there will be a test. Yeah. Um, I will fail as much as anybody else will, so don't feel bad. Uh, but what did you think of this first eight issues of The Invisibles? Let us know in the comments down below. If you want to join The Invisible College online, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a link to a, a Discord in the comments down... Or, uh, I'm sorry, in the, uh, description, the description down below. Filled mm -hmm. with uh, an ever-growing collection of wonderfully weird and bizarre people mm -hmm. yeah uh, and speaking of discords we have uh, a discord for the channel that's right mm -hmm. the Imperius rex discord yes that's right uh you can get uh to that through access through our patreon and we've got uh, quite a few members of that that like are just happening They're, they've got it happening in there 24 7 wonderful people uh, absolutely along with that you get like you know the usual patron rewards tiers sure all yep. that it's a yeah. great group. It's a great group. Yeah, it's a great group. Yeah, it's a great group. <laughs> and not only that, it supports what we're doing right here. If yeah. You've wa if you're actually watching this all the way through, obviously you you like the cut of our jib. Yeah. So like, <laughs> a little support helps keep these things going. These mm -hmm. don't, they don't just happen overnight. Yeah. You know. So with all that addressed, big thanks uh, to Cody Walker. Yes. To our wonderful patrons, our viewers, even if you're not a patron, still appreciate it. Thank you. Smash that like button or whatever you do. Uh, uh, Lisa Crowley, who created the amazing theme song. Lovely. The original theme song. Thank you so episode. much. It's great. Uh, all those that have enrolled in the Invisible College Discord. Mm -hmm. Thank Drew you. Markham for show art. And uh, anyone else that we might have missed. You two, for instance. Thank you. Wonderful. Join us again as we reconvene <laughs> for Volume 2, Apocalyptic. Wow. wow. April. Great title. Yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> Tell us who you are. Uh, I've been short of the Max Extreme. Dinosaur Neil. Ghost Hunter Dave. Even Pierce Rex. But that's going to be it. That's the first class. And uh, I would say class is dismissed. A uh, theme that goes or that Morrison introduces in this and then expands on in other works that they write is uh, fiction suits. So this is where we can talk a little bit about what you brought up. King Mob summons John Lennon prior to going into battle. And this whole concept is kind of like using magic to replace old gods, you know, that one would worship, with new pop deities, new gods, that are more culturally relevant and significant to the person that's worshipping them. And I think that's an interesting idea. Because, like... You know, like, I'm not going to say a prayer to, like, Zeus, you know? <laughs> but, like, I would ask for inspiration from, like, a David Bowie or something. Who would you pick that would give you the most guidance for that situation that you're going into? King Mob's going in, guns blaze, and he wants to be this fucking cool assassin. He summons John Lennon to be like, give me the fucking way, John. <laughs> So, Seems like an odd choice. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Be John Wayne and some John Lennon. <laughs> I wouldn't be fucking John Wayne. <laughs> uh, Draft out and son of a bitch. Yeah. I, I look at, like, Gaiman's New Gods approach, where, like, one's technology, mm -hmm. or it's, like, those big concepts. Like, I get that. If, and it's still, like, it's the same concepts. It's just, like, personified more through something that down. is more, like, fitting to you. How yeah, you where you can see the face of that. But, like, my thing is, I if I was looking for something like that, the last person, or the last thing I'd ask is a real person. 
Does that, if that makes any sense at all? Like, because I'm like, oh, you're just a guy. I don't give a shit what just a guy thinks, regardless of what you, you wrote a good song or two. I don't give a fucking shit. But like, I, I think it's more about, like, what you, what that person, what humanity has put on that person to, like, give them that God status. Mm. Because yeah. a lot of this, um, they go into that, too, with the guillotine. Like, the guillotine is an object that they've bestowed, like, beliefs on, and they've empowered, right. and they've seen it as, like, this thing gives power back to the people. When Dane is in the sewers with Tom O'Bedlam, they see just, like, this weird conglomeration of parts. He's like, what the fuck's this? He's like, it's a totem. Like, what is it? He's like, I don't know, but people, like, built this, and it means something to them. You give the object or the person meaning. Yeah. And because, like, in Morrison's Pop Magic, and this is something that, like, Cody Walker talked about in our last, Professor Cody Walker, talked about, not a real professor, but an educator, <laughs> talked about in our pre-reading episode, you're obvious, You're not really talking to John Lennon. Yeah. You're talking about... You're talking with what you think John Lennon would do. You're getting into the mindset of John Lennon. You're putting on that fiction suit of John mm -hmm. Lennon. Like, this is how, if I ask John Lennon a question, I have to make myself think, like, how would John Lennon respond to that? So you're getting into that mindset, and that is helping you handle this situation. Yeah. And I think that is kind of like giving a very literal iteration of how that would play out. Like this conceptual thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd be more inclined to ask, because I think this was another example that maybe he or even Grant talked about. Is like, say you want to talk to Superman or Batman. Mm -hmm. I'd rather talk to the fictional character. Mm -hmm. And this is just going to be a... Because they're an ideal. Well, that's... it's just, And that's exactly it. Because I... Like, the bias I've got right now of saying, if it's John Lennon, if it's David Bowie, if it's Zach Braff, whatever, whatever. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like you, well, he's still alive. You could probably just go, you have to. I to have talked to Zach Braff. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I don't. Rather talk to Donald Faison if he has. Uh, he so was there, too. Oh, God damn it. I think Morrison chose a Beatle specifically because the Beatles it were like godlike power. The yeah. Beatles were bigger than Jesus. Yeah. So I think yeah. that is a an example of a human that has achieved almost like a deity like status. Yeah. Whereas if he summoned a Zach Braff, someone <laughs> might raise an eyebrow <laughs> unless they were big Scrubs fans <laughs> or Garden State fans. The idea of fiction suits evolved from here to like a very literal thing where in Animal Man, which we haven't read and probably will do a book club on at some point, Morrison actually puts themselves, Grant Morrison, into the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they also dub that a fiction suit. It's like the act of illustrating them is almost as if you're putting yourself in like an astronaut suit or a dive suit to explore this two-dimensional comic world, which is a... A ridiculous concept, but that is what the concept it's is. It's like highly you, more meta. It's yeah. so <laughs> yeah. meta. The layers yeah. of meta are insane. Yeah, so like we we had some comments on like what Cody described as a fiction suit might not be like the literal fiction suit, but I feel like this is a concept that Morrison has evolved with their writing and expanded mm -hmm. into various things. Whereas like the literal fiction suit I think is so meta that it's almost its own thing. Whereas, like, this idea of summoning somebody and, like, kind of taking on their personality and calling that a fiction suit, I think that's just as applicable. Oh, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And uh, the Dane's teacher, who we said the real MVP of this, <laughs> story, the real hero, Mr. Yeah. Malky. That's your mouth. Um, he, uh, <laughs> he may be a fiction suit himself. Ooh. And he may come back. As the fucking grooviest character in this entire run. Austin, Austin Powers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Another interesting thing I just thought: the Robin reads tarot cards at one point. Yeah. She uh, pulls the card of the moon. The moon is the darkness that gives birth to light. Another analogy for the soil that humanity grows in. Fun little fact, the last tattoo I got was a tarot card of the moon. Yeah. Not planned at all. But <laughs> look at, look at that. <laughs> look at Dave's arm. Look at my got arm. Got a moon on it. <laughs> got a moon. Got a moon goddess. I don't mean to interrupt here again, but 
You might like this. More plant-related stuff. Oh okay, boy. I'm into it. So, right. <laughs> I like the idea of, like, people now. Think, like, think of it, plants, people. They're the same thing in this, in this analogy. But, you like, okay. when you're growing your garden, you want that nice, fertilizer-rich soil. Yeah. Shit. Manure. Of sorts, maybe. Sometimes. <laughs> or it's, compost or it's just a either. compost or that white pellet stuff you can just kind of mix in with your dirt. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you can do that. But I like to look at the other end of it is like I have, or like in my house, like I do more internal house plants, like cactuses mm -hmm. or other things that grow in very mm -hmm. terrible soil, mm -hmm. but they still achieve the same goal through different means. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Interesting. Connecting? Sure. <laughs> interesting you had at first, and then you kind of went a little bit... The, but don't but you get, get it? it? But the soil isn't rich, so you have to find your way... A you have to find it a different way. Yeah. Sure. You have to find... And even through trials and tribulations, let's say uh, you, you, break through, you break through the soil, and you're living your life, and you're taking a hard pruning. You know what? <laughs> yeah. You're still going to overcome, because the pruning is going to make you grow as a person more, because it's going to make you... Blossom and branch out in other ways you never thought you could. Mm -hmm. There is uh, there is some very serious trials and tribulations that Lord Fanny undertakes in the next volume. Mm. Before you do that. Yeah, piss again? Nope. I just <laughs> want to show you John Lennon's The Longest Ass in History next to Yoko Ono, The Smallest Ass in History. Is this that rolling? Oh. Oh my god! <laughs> What? I saw this a week ago, and it's never left my brain. Is that real? I can't tell. That's but disturbing. But, like, his ass is halfway up his back, and then she's what? got Hank Hill's ass. Oh, my God. It's like, together they have one full ass. <laughs> Dualism. <laughs> Hold on. Search John Lennon Yoko Ono ass. John Lennon long ass. What the Fuck! Crack me open that last beer there. You bet I can. Or hand me it. Yeah. No. Oh, there you go. Good lord. Fiction to reality right <laughs> oh, before my eyes. 